Hello, everybody, and welcome to the seventh meeting of the Beer Evaluation course. This time, we will discuss advanced topics in brewing. Just wanted to remind you that if you like the video, please hit the like button, and if you have any questions, please comment on the video and I will answer. If you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, please click on the subscribe button and click on the bell icon to get notified when my next videos come out. In addition, if you haven't followed me on my social media, you can see them changing on the screen right now or find them in the description below. And now, without further ado, let's get to our presentation of the day about advanced topics in brewing. This is the seventh presentation of the beer evaluation course, and it is the fifth and last out of five presentations in which we discuss ingredients and processes in beer brewing and their effects on the final beer. In this presentation, we will discuss a few advanced topics in brewing. This is the layout of today's presentation. We will start by talking about kettle sour, then move on to wild and spontaneous fermentation, adding fruits and spices to beer, stabilization, aging, oaking, blending, carbonation, and packaging. And we will start by talking about kettle sour. Kettle souring is a quick method of souring unfermented wort. In this process, after the sparge, the brewer sterilizes the wort with a short boil, and after boiling for a short time, the brewer cools the wort to 24 to 35 degrees Celsius. Then, the brewer will add lactobacillus and maintain a temperature of about 40 degrees Celsius, which encourages the growth of lactobacillus for one to three days. When the wort reaches the desired pH, the brewer will boil the wort again to sanitize it from the lactobacillus and transfer it to normal fermentation. The benefits of this method are that it allows brewers to churn out sour beers in days instead of years. In addition, the brewers keep the bacterial contamination on the hot side of the brewery, and the wort is sterilized by boiling before moving it to the cold side of the brewery. But, the brewer should also pay attention to several things when doing it, so as not to get off flavors. If oxygen is present during the bacterial activity, off flavors can appear. In addition, lowering the wort's pH to 4.5 can help suppress the activity of other bacteria. Also, to speed up the process, it is recommended to prepare a small starter for the lactobacillus culture. And finally, as with the yeast fermentation, the temperature should be monitored and kept at an optimal temperature for the lactobacillus strain being used. After we talked about how you can kettle sour a beer, we will move on to talk about wild or spontaneous fermentation beers. Today's brewers have many varieties of yeast to choose from but some brewers choose to catch their own yeast. They usually do it because it's fun, cool, and they can get really special flavors from it. To catch yeast, the brewers will start with planning. Things to consider when catching yeast are weather, temperature, time of day, and the season. Usually, the brewers will want to do it in the evening when the temperatures are lower, but not too low and preferably not on days when the air pollution is high. After deciding on the time, the brewers will prepare the equipment they will need and wort. They will start by preparing about 1.5 liters of wort, with 2 grams of hops and adjust the pH to about 4.5. This will help them prevent contamination from bacteria that will spoil the flavor and favor yeast. Then they will put the wort in a sterilized jar to make a trap. The opening will be covered with a tetra cloth or a cheesecloth and secured with a rubber band. For good results, 
they will usually prepare several yeast traps and place them in different places. At the time the brewers planned to catch the yeast, they would place the yeast traps outside, preferably near trees, plants, or beehives. It is preferable to have an environment clear of pests to avoid infections with spoilage bacteria that will give aromas of sewage. The traps are left outside for about nine hours. If everything went well, after a few days, the brewers will start to see active fermentation in the jars. It will not be a vigorous fermentation because the yeast needs time to build a population. When fermentation is complete, the brewers will taste the beers, evaluate the flavors they have, and then make a decision on which spontaneously fermented beers to use in the final beer. At this point, the brewers will make a larger starter to build a larger population and finally pitch it to the batch of beer they want to make. The organisms in such beers will usually work in waves. At first, Enterobacter and Chlorchera will work. These are gut bacteria which create the taste of vomit in such beers. After a few days, the population of Saccharomyces cerevisiae will be large enough and will begin to metabolize the sugar into alcohol. After the alcoholic fermentation, Pediococcus and Lactobacillus will start working to produce lactic acid. This phase lasts between three to six months, depending on the temperature. The Pediococcus can also cause the appearance of so-called sick beer. It basically creates polymers that make the beer become slimy. But don't worry, because after this phase, the Britannomyces yeast will be ready after they have developed and built a population for a long time. They will take over the beer. The bread will break down the polymers of the slime that the Pediococcus created and will also break down the sugars and starches that the Saccharomyces were unable to break down. In addition, the bread will also contribute its characteristic flavors of barn, wet dog, etc. Of course, there are many other organisms found in such beers. But here, I talked about the most important ones in terms of flavor contribution. Note that it takes at least nine months for such beers at room temperature to finish developing all the different flavors. After we've talked about the fermentation of spontaneously fermented beers, we will talk about another method of preparing spontaneously fermented beers called the Solera method. This method was adopted from the Spanish sherry winemakers, but with a change in the method itself, so that it fits one barrel and doesn't require at least three barrels. In the beer Solera method, the brewers start by filling a barrel with wort and letting it ferment until all the phases are finished. When the beer is ready, the brewers take out between a third to half of the quantity, depending on who you ask, and fill the remaining volume in the barrel with new unfermented wort. The new wort will restart the fermentation cycle and the beer will ferment again. After the beer has finished fermenting, the brewers will empty half of the amount again and return a new wort. Let the beer ferment and repeat again and again. The advantages of this method are that the beer will get the flavors of aging in a barrel in a fraction of the time it would take if only new wort was fermented. And also we will get uniformity between batches. Notice that in most cases, the flavors will stabilize and be more pleasant from the third batch onwards. After we talked about sour beers, both kettle and fermentation sour beers, we'll move on to talk about adding fruits and spices to beers. When we bite into a fruit, we feel the fruity aroma followed by sweetness, and then a refreshing acidity that cleanses the palate. The key to brewing with any fruit, vegetable, or spice is to brew a good beer and use these ingredients to accentuate flavors. It is also desirable that the beer that is brewed should not be too bitter since the fruit will add acidity, and acidity and bitterness clash with each other to create a harsh, unpleasant flavor. Therefore, 
when a brewer plans a fruit beer, they will use the same thought process as with making breads or pastries with fruit. After all, most malts will add the flavors of flour, dough, or bread with the addition of fruit. Another important thing to remember is that fruits also add sugar that the yeast will metabolize. So you need to give the yeast time for the fermentation of these sugars. After we understood how to plan such beers, we should talk about how much fruit should be added to a beer. The amount of fruit will vary according to the brewer's preferences, the style of the beer, and the sweetness and type of fruit. As a rule of thumb, the brewers will use 60 to 240 grams per liter of fruit in the beer, and in most cases, the amount will depend on the strength of the fruit. But this is just a rule of thumb. There are beers with over 400 grams of fruit per liter. If raspberries or cherries are used, usually 60 grams per liter will be enough. In contrast, blueberries and strawberries will need between 240 to 360 grams per liter. Stone fruits of all kinds, such as apricots, nectarines, etc., will add a lot of flavor to the beer, so less are used. This is with the exception of peach, which has less flavor and aroma than other stone fruits. With citrus fruits, brewers can use the juice, but using only the peels or zest will usually give better results. If the brewers want to have more complexity and intensity, they can add the fruits in several phases and not all at once. After we talked about how much fruit should be added, we will talk about how to add the fruit. Let's start by preparing the fruit for the beer. First of all, the brewers will sort the fruits to discard low quality or fruits with mold. They will remove all the branches and leaves of all kinds, and next they will clean the fruits and chop them, and then freeze them. The freezing will cause the water in the cells of the fruit to expand and burst from the cell walls, so that the juice can escape from the cells into the beer. When using fruit in the main fermentation, there is no need to mash the fruit because the yeast will work on it and remove every flavor compound. But it is advisable to crush the fruits a bit before adding them to the fermenter. After we talked about how to add fruit, we will talk about when to add it. The first time the brewer can add fruit is in the main fermentation. But if they do, most of the volatile molecules will leave the beer with the carbon dioxide that is vented during fermentation. The next time they can add fruit is in the secondary fermentation. If they do this, the second fermentation will last for weeks or months until the yeast metabolizes with the sugars in the fruit and extracts the juice from it. Another method that can be used is to ferment the fruit separately from the beer and blend them at the end. The downside here that it takes a long time from the flavors to come together. This phase is called the marriage phase. The brewers can also add the fruit after fermentation has finished and the beer is stabilized. That is, it no longer has yeast that will ferment sugars. With this method, the fruit flavor is maximized. Sometimes, however, it can add a sugary, sweet, or raw fruit flavor since it has not gone under fermentation. In addition, bacteria can arrive with the fruit, contaminate the beer, and create off flavors from the fruit sugars. After we talked about fruit beers, let's talk for a minute about adding spices to beer. Adding spices to beer is simpler, since the brewers do not add fermentable sugars, and do not have to worry about re-fermentation. But, on the other hand, getting a pleasant balance with spices is more difficult than with fruit because very little can add a lot of flavor. To add spices, the brewers will start by choosing the spices they want to add and the final balance between them that they want to get. And now, they have to choose when they will be added and by what method they will be added to the beer. 
The first time the brewers can add spices is to steep them at the end of the boil. But this has to be done for minutes like in a tea, and then the spices should be removed. Otherwise, harsh flavors will be extracted from the spices. Spices can also be added to the main fermentation, but the flavor of the spices will change and will turn into fermented spices, which can be different from the flavor of the original spices. Spices can also be added in the secondary fermentation, but since they have to be added for a much shorter time than any secondary fermentation, unwanted flavors can be extracted as well. Spices can also be added right before packaging either by tea or by tincture. The brewers can simply make a tea and then blend to the desired flavor. Tincture, on the other hand, means to soak the spices in a neutral flavored alcoholic drink. Clean vodka can be good for this use and let the alcohol dissolve the flavor and aroma compounds from the spices and create an intensely aromatic liquid. This liquid can then be added to the beer for the desired flavor just before packaging. Since the last two methods use boiling water and a high percentage of alcohol, there is no risk of contaminating the beer with spoilage bacteria. Another thing that is important to pay attention to, especially if spice additions to the beer itself are used, is how can the brewer separate the beer from the spices. Now that we've talked about adding fruits and spices to the beer, we will move on to talk about stabilizing the beer. Stabilization of the beer means that the brewers try to preserve the flavor and aroma of the beer so that they will not change over time. The changes can be related to aging, and we will talk about these in the next section, or related to haze-forming compounds in the beer. In order to remove haze-forming compounds, the brewers will use clarifying agents. These particles can be yeast, proteins, polyphenols, and more. In addition, in order to maintain the flavor as well as the carbonation level, it is important to remove the yeast from the beer by racking and leaving the yeast behind, by filtering out the beer or by rapid pasteurization. Now we will expand a little on the clarification of beer. Clarifying agents work to remove haze from the beer. This haze can be caused by yeast found in the beer, protein particles, pectin haze if fruit was used, haze from starch that has not been broken down, polyphenols that can bind to proteins and give both astringency and haze, or even haze that comes from metallic pollution. To clarify an average beer, the brewer will start by cold crushing the beer. This means the brewer will lower the temperature to lagering temperatures. These can range between minus one to five degrees centigrade. After cold crushing, positive and negative charge clarifying agents will be used. These can be Irish moss, isinglass, or polyclar. If clarifying agents did not suffice, the brewer will centrifuge the beer or even filter it. If it's a fruit beer, the brewer can add some pectinase, which is an enzyme that breaks down pectin and can be found in stores that specialize in baking. Common methods of clarification includes transferring the beer through a filter. These filters can be of different sizes or of different types. Filters will remove yeast and other substances. Though the brewers have to be careful not to remove too many compounds and remove too much color and or flavors. It is possible to add clarifying agents, as I said. These will bind to the compounds the brewers wishes to remove and eventually they will fall out of the solution. Clarifying agents can be added during the boiling stage or after fermentation. The brewer can let compounds sediment over time. However, that can take a long time that sometimes they don't have. Large breweries will use centrifuges to separate most of the solids from the beer before the filter. 
that way filtering is faster. After filtering, the yeast are no longer in the beer. So brewers must use external carbon dioxide to carbonate the beer. And now that we've talked about stabilizing the beer, we will move on to talk about aging of beer and what are its sensorial impacts on the beer. Aging beer causes the following changes. Esters, bitterness, and flavor intensity decreases. The alcoholic flavor and mouthfeel becomes softer and rounder, and the color becomes a little lighter, as a result of sedimentation of color compounds. Proteins, tannins, yeast, and other compounds settle in the bottle, and the flavor becomes smoother and more unified. If the beer is exposed to oxygen during aging, negative effects will appear. Color will become darker, there will be loss of clarity, aroma and flavors of hops will disappear, acetaldehyde will be formed as a result of oxidation of alcohol and aerobic bacteria that require oxygen to work will be able to work and spoil the beer. If a light beer with a low alcohol content oxidizes, an aroma and flavor of wet cardboard and honey will appear. Oxygen has only one result that is positive, which is the formation of sherry aroma and flavor. This happens when melanoidins found in dark beers with a lot of alcohol oxidize. Therefore, if you want to age a beer, you should age beers with melanoidins. Beers in which the main flavor ingredient is hops should not be aged. If the brewers wish to avoid the effects of oxygen, they can wax the cork, use synthetic corks instead of wood corks, which are porous, and refrain from using crown corks. In addition, while aging, they will lower the temperatures to slow down the rate of the effects of oxygen on the beer. As a rule of thumb, 10 degrees increase in temperature cuts aging time in half. It is also very important to avoid exposure to light, which can create a skunky aroma in the beer. Non-oxygen-related effects in aging include the breakdown of protein complexes in the beer. This, in extreme cases, can cause the appearance of white particles in the beer. If the beer is shaken or cooled too quickly, polyphenols can attach to proteins that contain an amino acid called proline and create what is called chill haze. This haze will disappear when the beer is reheated. But if the beer goes through several cycles of cooling and heating, or if it is shaken for a long time, the haze will become permanent. To prevent the appearance of haze, the brewer can use an enzyme called prolyl, or its brand name, Brewer's Clarex, which will break down the enzymes with proline and prevent the formation of haze in the beer. If the beer is bottled with yeast, the yeast can break down in a process called autolysis and release their contents into the beer. This can create a rubbery and umami flavors. Some will describe it as soy sauce. After we talked about the impact of aging on beer, we will move on to talk about how to age beer. Beer can be aged in the bottle. In this case, there is good protection against oxygen, but on the other hand, it is difficult for the brewers to make adjustments to the beer. The second method is to age the whole batch together. With this method, the brewers can balance the beer easily after aging. Fermentation can end, the beer becomes clearer, and the final product will be much more consistent from bottle to bottle. It can be done either in inert vessels, such as stainless steel or glass, or in semi-permeable containers, mainly wood. After we talked about aging and its effects on the beer, we will move on to talk about the effects of aging in or with wood. Oak can come from all kinds of places, but mostly it will come from America, Hungary, and France. In addition, it is traditional to char the wood. This can be in a wide range of degrees of charring. The oak can come in all kinds of forms, from barrels of different sizes, oak staves, parts of barrels, chips, cubes, powders, and oak extract. 
in most cases, it is easiest to find chips and cubes. The contact time with the oak should be monitored. As a rule of thumb, smaller shapes of wood will take less time to extract flavor because there is more surface area in contact with the beer. So, what are the flavors that can be added to beer if it is aged in wood? If it is new wood, there will be wood and oak flavors, in addition to a raw green flavor. Vanilla can appear as a result of vanillin found in the wood. In addition, if there was acetic or lactic bacteria in the wood, acidity could appear. And since the wood allows a little oxygen to pass through, oxidation flavors will be created. If they are primarily sherry, it is excellent. If they are more of paper or wet cardboard, it is less good. On the other hand, the brewers can use used wood. If the brewers used a toasted wood, flavors of caramel, candies, and butterscotch, toast, or almonds can appear. In addition, alcoholic flavors from the products that were aged in a barrel before can transfer into the beer. Bourbon barrels are very popular for aging beer, since distillers can only use them once and then have to sell them. Bourbon barrels will contribute flavors and aroma of coffee, chocolate, cocoa, bourbon, and vanilla, and so they are widely used in imperial stouts. But the brewers are not limited to spirit barrels. Wine barrels that wineries have stopped using can be a great option for sour beers. Wine is a beverage in which balance is between sweetness and acidity and not bitterness. This fits the balance of a tart beer and will contribute flavors and aromas of wine and fruits. One of the most problematic and difficult things about wood is to clean it to a sanitary level. Therefore, in most cases, bacteria and wild yeast will remain in the wood. We call it the barrel microflora. So, besides the flavors of the wood, the flavors of the microflora find in the wood will appear. In most cases, there will be some kind of lactic or acetic acidity coming from the lactic bacteria or acetobacter, or even earthiness from bread. Wild yeast and bacteria, in most cases, will contribute a wide variety of flavors and aromas that are acceptable in sour beers, but are considered off flavors in other styles. Therefore, Barrels are very convenient for making sour beers since the microflora can settle in the wood, meaning the brewer can use the barrels again and again and get similar flavors. After we talked about aging and using wood, we will move on to talk about blending different beers. Blending is mixing the beer with another drink. It can be with another beer, fermented fruits, spice tinctures, meads, ciders, and more. Blending is basically another method of balancing the final beer. The common reasons why brewers choose to blend a beer can be to add bitterness or acidity, to add sweetness if the beer is too bitter or sour, to add complexity if the beer has a one-dimensional flavor, to create a different style of beer, to create a unique beer, or to get rid of a bad batch that, if it will be blended, will be drinkable. To blend, first the brewers will taste each of the beverages separately and analyze their flavor components with the strength and intensity of each component. Next, the brewers will think about the concept they want to get from the final beverage, and then try to create it in a small batch while writing down the amounts from each blended beverage. If it doesn't turn out well, they will fix it until they will have the result they are looking for. And only at the end, they will blend a big batch according to the quantities they used in the small experiment. After we talked about blending the beer, the next step is carbonating the beer. Carbonating of beer is the addition of dissolved carbon dioxide to the beer. Carbon dioxide can bind to water relatively easy and in large quantities. The colder the liquid, the more carbon dioxide will bind to it. 
But because it is possible to introduce a relatively large amount of carbon dioxide, the brewers must have a way of measuring how much carbon dioxide they introduced into the beer. Therefore, dissolved carbon dioxide in beer is measured in carbon dioxide volumes. These volumes are basically equivalent to a gram of carbon dioxide dissolved in a liter of beer. Common carbonation levels of beer will be between 1.5 to 2.6 grams per liter. Lagers are usually carbonated to 2.5 to 2.7 grams per liter. In highly carbonated styles, such as German wheat beers, saisons, Goes, etc., there will be 3 to 3.5 grams per liter. At the other end of the range, we'll have cask ales with 0.8 to 2.2 grams per liter of dissolved carbon dioxide. After we understood to what level brewers should carbonate the beer, we will move on to talk about how the beer is carbonated. There are three main methods of carbonating beer. There may be other methods, but in most cases, they will be a variation of one of the main three methods. In the first method, the brewers capture the carbon dioxide the yeast release during fermentation. This method is common in Germany to maintain the Reinheitsgebot. To do this, towards the end of the fermentation, the brewers will close the fermenter and not let carbon dioxide out of the tank. The yeast will create CO2 and will raise the pressure and carbonation of the beer. Note that this can be dangerous, so the brewers have to make sure the automatic pressure relief valve is working. On the other hand, the brewers can use an external CO2 tank to carbonate the beer. If this method is used, in most cases, the beer will go through the stabilization process that includes clarification, pasteurization, etc. And finally, when the beer is in the tank, the brewers will connect an external tank of CO2 and increase the pressure of the beer. It can be done with advanced systems that carbonate the beer in line, as in the top picture, or simply in the tank. The amount of CO2 that will bind to the beer depends on the pressure it exerts on the liquid and the temperature of the liquid. The colder the temperature, the more CO2 will bind. There are carbonation tables on the internet like you see on the lower right side to help the brewer determine the pressure by the desired grams per liter of dissolved CO2 and temperature. The next method we'll talk about also uses yeast to carbonate the beer. But instead of doing it in a fermenter during the main fermentation, here it is done in the bottle. There are also styles that traditionally require carbonation in the bottle, such as Belgian beers or German wheat beers, in which the yeast is even poured into the glass. Many home brewers use this method because it is relatively simple to perform and does not require an investment in kegs and a draft system. In this method, the brewers will add Speise, which is a mixture of yeast, sugar, and optionally clarifying agents to the beer before bottling. Next, they will bottle the beer and close the bottle. The yeast will metabolize the sugar and create carbon dioxide that will climb to the neck of the bottle and eventually be absorbed back by the beer. In the end, the yeast will sink to the bottom of the bottle. When pouring such beer, avoid pouring the yeast sediment to the glass unless it's German wheat beer. The main advantage of using this method is that if there is oxygen that reached the beer in the bottle, the yeast will use it. Thus, the formation of oxidation of flavors is reduced. After we talked about the level beer should be carbonated and the carbonation methods, we will summarize the topic of carbonation with the impact of carbonation on the final beer. Carbon dioxide turns into carbonic acid in the solution. It provides a zing and a tickle on the tongue 
that cleanses the palate and prepares it for the next bite of food or the next sip of beer. In recent years, scientists have discovered that we have special receptors in our mouths for carbonic acid, and there is a chance that CO2 actually has its own taste. But there are still not enough studies that confirms it, so I don't want to talk about it in depth in this course. But the theory is very interesting. Carbonation makes the beer feel lighter on the palate. Basically, it lowers the feeling of body in the beer. In addition, carbon dioxide that comes out of the beer in the form of a foam head shoots compounds from the beer into the drinker's nose, which makes it very important for the beer's aroma. The foam also creates a barrier between the beer and the air, which protects the beer from oxidation while drinking. In conclusion, if you are bartending, the next time someone asks you for a beer without foam, you're welcome to roll your eyes. After we talked about carbonating the beer, we will move on to talk about the last topic of this presentation, which is packaging. There are all kinds of packaging methods for beer. Beer can be packaged in kegs for sale as draft in bars. Most of the beer sold in kegs is not pasteurized because inline pasteurization raises a lot of engineering problems and only in very large breweries it is economic to have such equipment. Therefore, you should always keep kegs refrigerated to reduce the rate of flavor degradation. Kegs can come in many sizes, shapes, connectors, and more. In addition to kegs for bars, beer can also be packaged in bottles. Like kegs, bottles come in lots of sizes and colors. At this point, I want to mention what we talked about in the fifth presentation of this course on hops, the skunk. Since bottles in most cases are permeable to light, a skunky aroma can develop in the bottles that have been exposed to UV light. This can mean in the sun or under any light that emits UV. Note, there are special 400 nanometer UV lights that do not emit UV. These are the only lights you want to have in a beer fridge. Opaque bottles will block all the light and the beer will not be damaged. Brown bottles block 80% of the range of harmful light and are therefore the better option. Green bottles block only 20% of the range of harmful light. Blue bottles that are sometimes used for beer block only 7% of the harmful light and transparent bottles do not block anything. In most cases, breweries releasing beer in blue or clear bottles will use hop extracts that are light stable. Besides bottles and kegs, there are also cans. Cans are an excellent option for packaging beer. First of all, they weigh considerably less, meaning easy transportation. Besides, since cans don't have a neck, they are stackable. And finally, they offer excellent protection from light and oxygen. Beer can also be served from a cask. A cask is a container in which both the second fermentation and the serving are carried out. I don't want to go into cask service here because it's not in the scope of this course, but we'll talk about it in depth in a future beer storage and serving course. Finally, if the brewers are in a bar setting, the beer can be served from a large container that holds a whole batch instead of using barrels. These tanks can be conical fermenters that can hold pressure. These are called unitanks. Or the tanks can be tanks to which the beer is transferred after fermentation and then it is carbonated which are called bright tanks. Following packaging comes the quality control phase. In beer quality control, the first test is to make sure that there is no bacterial contamination in the containers and or in the beer to protect it from flavor change. The second thing to test is for oxygen presence in the containers. Oxygen will cause the flavor and aroma of beer to turn stale, 
and aromas of wet paper or cardboard to appear. In order to avoid oxygen, brewers will flush the containers with CO2 before filling and only then fill it with beer. To empty the oxygen from the neck of the bottle before capping it, the brewer will agitate the beer to produce foam filled with CO2 and then cap the beer on the foam. The last process to talk about today is the process of pasteurization. To pasteurize the beer, the brewers heat it to kill yeast and other organisms. Since heating the beer creates cooked flavors, the brewers try to do it at as low a temperature as possible and for as short a time as possible to kill the organisms in the beer with as little damage to the flavor and aroma as possible. Usually, the beer will be heated to 60 degrees Celsius and kept there for a few minutes. The advantages of pasteurized beer are that it will not develop flavors similar to wine over time, and its flavor will not change up to twice as long as unpasteurized beer. By comparison, unpasteurized beer will last in the refrigerator without the flavor changing for 45 to 60 days. In contrast, pasteurized beer will last 90 to 120 days without the flavor changing. This is where we finish the seventh presentation of the beer course about advanced topics in brewing. I hope that the talk was informative and interesting. And I want to remind you that if you like the video, please hit the subscribe button, like button, and click the bell icon to know when the next videos come out. If you have questions, please write them in the comments. I promise to go over them. In addition, you can see my social media handles change on the screen or find them in the description of this video. And you're welcome to follow me to know when my next projects come out. Since this channel requires a lot of investment on my side, subscribing will also help me out a lot. Thank you for listening. I was Omar Basha and see you in the next presentation where we will discuss the beer evaluation process.